Uh, will you turn with me in your Bible to the book of Joshua, which we are studying on Sunday mornings? Last Sunday we traced the critical experience of God's people as they crossed the River Jordan and entered the land that God had covenanted to give them as far back as the days of Abraham. And now God is here as the covenant-keeping faithful God, ready to lead them into this land of his promise. The River Jordan was a place of great challenge to God's people. It was the challenge of the unfamiliar and the challenge of the unwelcome and uninviting, for Jordan was a raging torrent of flood water we found at this time of the year, And there God demonstrated his power in a signal fashion for his people by cleaving a path through this Jordan with all that it meant to the people of God, the unfamiliar, unwelcome, impossible barrier to their progress. And God cut a path through it for them. And they raised a memorial at Gilgal to the power of God with the stones that they brought up out of the Jordan. But now almost immediately they find themselves confronted with an equally bewildering set of circumstances. They are wedged between Jordan and Jericho. Jordan behind them cut off the possibility of retreat. There was no going back now, in a sense, having crossed the Jordan, they were committed. And there is a sense in which, amongst the many things Jordan stands for, and I was suggesting to you to the distress of some that it didn't stand for death, and Canaan didn't stand for heaven, may I plead with you again to distinguish between hymnology and theology. We do not get our theology from hymns but from scripture. But one of the things Jordan does stand for is the consecration of God's people to God's future. And that is what they were doing when they followed God across the Jordan. They were consecrating themselves to God's future. And the Jordan River flowed back to its former raging torrent and they were cut off from the possibility of retreat. But then in front of them, there was raised the vision of this fortified city of Jericho, which apparently cut off the possibility of advance. Now that is part of the lesson of this book of Joshua. The people of God are engaged in a warfare. That's one of the reasons that Canaan is not a picture of heaven. The first thing they had to do in Canaan was fight. And Canaan's rest, of which Hebrews 3 speaks, is a rest of consecration to God's will and obedience to his way, but it is a place of conflict of adversaries constantly around them. And here God's people discover that their warfare is not an isolated battle but a sustained campaign. Now that is an important truth for us to grasp. This is Christian life. This is what the life of God's progressing people consists of. It is a sustained campaign of constant battle and watchfulness. So that means that one victory is not the end of the war. And it also means that one defeat is not the end of the warrior. Each victory will help you some other to win. And that is the point of this crossing of the Jordan and the battle at Jericho and every other military encounter that God's people had. Each victory is to prepare you for another victory. It is not to extract you from the warfare. And there is no encounter with God. There is no encounter with the devil and his forces which will withdraw you in this world from the warfare to which the people of God are committed. And when there is a defeat, 
it is vital for us to grasp that God is not finished with us as God's people found after this next chapter we will come to soon in Ai. We are to say from the place where we may hap fall, Rejoice not against me, O mine adversary. When I fall, I shall rise again. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Now, from beginning to end, this account of Joshua and the people of God at Jericho brings before us three principles which are embedded in the record of the victory at Jericho. And we need to take them up and recognize them as God-given principles for Christian living and Christian service. And we need to apply them to our own lives. Let me tell you what they are, first of all, and then we will look at each of them as it must be fairly briefly. The first is the principle of divine leadership, which is in the last few verses of chapter 5. The second is the principle of divine strategy, which runs through chapter 6. And the third is the principle of divine victory or power, which underlies the whole of this record that God has given to us. And let me say to you again that one of the great reasons for studying the book of Joshua is that God's dealings with his people are universally the same. There is a pattern about the way God deals with his people through the history of the Old Testament and in our own contemporary experience. A word then about this principle of divine leadership, which we have come across at various times in our studies, but seems to me to be cardinal and fundamental in its importance for all our thinking about living for God and serving God in the world. The real introduction to this astonishing victory at Jericho, and in a sense its secret, is the encounter Joshua has in chapter 5 from verse 13, where he meets this strange figure of a man standing before him with drawn sword in his hand and Joshua goes to speak with him but soon discovers that this is no mere man. He finds that this figure is someone of an altogether different order and at the end of this brief paragraph Joshua is putting his shoes from off his feet because the place where he is standing is holy and bows himself down with his face to the earth to worship. So clearly the figure who is here confronting Joshua is none other than the Lord of hosts himself making himself known to Joshua before the battle begins. Now Joshua is quite near the beginning of a long life of service and there never was a more important moment in his life than this. He was, of course, absorbed, as the record makes clear, with the difficulties and challenge and excitement of this situation. No doubt he would be assessing it and reconnoitering the area around about Jericho because by this time Joshua had a measure of experience in this kind of warfare. He was no fool, nor was he a novice. And he was assessing the situation and measuring it and thinking about it. And then suddenly this heavily armed figure appears before him and Joshua challenges him. It was the one thing, this question that he asked, it was the one thing that mattered about anybody who came within his orbit at this time. Whose side are you on, he says? Are you for us or for our enemies? And the man says to Joshua, you have the question wrong. Because the issue is not whether I am on your side or on the other side. The real issue is whether you are on my side. As captain of the Lord's host I have come, he says. I have come not to serve under you. You are here to serve under me. And that was the fundamental distinction Joshua needed to learn about Christian service. And it is the soul-searching question 
about divine leadership that God brings before us in every comparable situation and at every comparable stage of life. It is the primary lesson in Christian service. Whether Joshua was going to accept the principle of divine leadership and let God be God in his own kingdom. Now that is at one and the same time a great rebuke and warning. And it is also a great reassurance and encouragement. It is a great warning and rebuke because God is saying to Joshua... I am the one who is here in charge of the Lord's cause. I am the one who is making the plans and forming the strategy and arranging the timetable. And what Joshua was misunderstanding was that it was possible for him to recruit God as his servant. And my dear friends, that is the ultimate blasphemy that it is possible for us to engage in in Christian service. And it is all too possible. This is the warning. You see, it's entirely possible for us to be engaged in reconnoitering the Lord's work making our plans, reviewing the situation, and then to recruit God as our servant. I'll tell you how we do that. We make our plans for our lives. We make our plans for our work. And then we say, Highly spiritual it sounds too. We spread our plans before the Lord and we said to him in effect, we hope you're on our side. And God says you've got it all wrong actually. Because the principle of Christian service that is cardinal and fundamental is that the initiative lies with God and not with men. And the principle of divine leadership implies this. Now it's a very important principle. And it means, you see, that you get your plans from God, that you get your timetable from God, that you recognize that the cause and the work and the glory and the leadership and the initiative are all God's, and therefore the primary thing for his people to do is to wait upon him. The greatest example of this in the Bible is Nehemiah, who when he faced this ruined city and was sent by God to rebuild it from the ashes of its destruction, came into the city and he wept over it and cried and cried because Jerusalem was in ruins. And what did he do? Well, I'll tell you what he did. To the eyes of men he did nothing for three months. Lazy bounder, they no doubt said. But you know what he was doing, do you? He was sitting down waiting on God. And he was waiting for God's plans and for God's strategy and for God's hour. And that hour came... And Nehemiah got up in the wake of God's purposes. And he found himself marching behind the living God as Joshua did here. And that's what it means to be involved in the Lord's work. And how vital that is. 
It is when God is on the move and says to a man like Joshua, I have given the city into your hands. Just come after me and watch what I do. The principle of divine leadership. But it's not only a word of rebuke, it's a word of gracious reassurance. What God is saying to him, you see, is the ultimate responsibility for all that is going to happen here, for taking this vast company of people forward into the next stage of my purpose. It doesn't rest on your shoulders, Joshua. He says, it doesn't rest on your shoulders, it rests on mine. As captain of the Lord's host I have come, I am the one who is bearing the responsibility. Now that's what ought to take the ultimate stress and strain out of serving God. There is stress and strain in serving God. Don't let's imagine there isn't. There is. There are many of God's servants in many parts of the world who have found themselves broken in body because of that. But there is a certain kind of strain that God knows we ought to be released from because the responsibility rests on God. And Joshua is meeting this man saying to him now, Joshua, he says, I have a jealous regard for my own glory and for my own cause and I am the captain of the Lord's host. And the army of the Lord, you see, is not just the soldiers of Israel. Indeed, they are only a small part of it. The army of the Lord is all the resources of heaven and earth, of nature and grace, the resources that the eternal God who has created the universe has at his disposal, and he calls them into being as he does here in Jericho. Oh, what it means to be under the captaincy of the Lord of hosts. You see, Nehemiah proved that too when God started to use kings and other people for his purposes. That's the reassurance that God is giving to Joshua at this point. But you will notice where he is found before there is any word about the battle. He is found worshipping, bowed down in the presence of God and saying, what does my Lord bid his servant? He's got it right, you see. And before we go out to serve God, we need to get that right too. There is, you see, a subduing of Joshua before the subduing of Jericho. There is a subduing of Jonah before the revival in Nineveh. And it's always so. He lies in the place of worship and obedience. And that is the place of usefulness. That leads me to the second thing, the divine strategy. For Joshua was now prepared to receive God's strategy from him, and that strategy was built on faith and confidence in God and not in men. As Hebrews 11 tells us, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down. Now that was precisely what happened. In chapter 6, verse 3, God begins to give them the strategy. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus you will do six days, and seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. And on the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, the priests blowing the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout. And the wall of the city will fall down flat and the people shall go up every man straight before him. Now that strategy was an extraordinary one. It was something that really needed to be believed as God's word to Joshua and his people because it must have presented an extraordinary spectacle. Let me read you some words that have been written about it. Could anything on earth be more utterly ridiculous 
First there were the armed men, then seven white-robed police priests blowing discordant ram's horns, trumpets, then the ark, and finally the people. For six days this motley crowd circumambulated Jericho in complete silence, except for the ram's horns, and then returned to their base. No doubt during the two hours or so which the performance may have lasted, the people of Jericho assembled in the walls above laughed at the absurd exhibition. It must have taken great faith to go on doing it seven days. It must have taken great confidence that God would indeed do as he had promised. But on the seventh day, which was probably a Sabbath, the procession compassed the city seven times instead of one. And at the end of the seventh circuit, the people at Joshua's command gave a fierce yell, and down came the walls of the city in ruinous confusion, and the host marched in and took possession, but nobody could have mistaken the lesson. It was God who had done it, and God alone who could possibly get glory from it. Now you see, it was out of that experience at the end of chapter 5 that Joshua had to be willing, because he was a military man, he had to be willing to take his strategy and put it at the feet of God and leave it there and pick up God's strategy and God's methodology instead of his own. For the simple reason that God's work has to be done God's way. Not enough just to be engaged in something we call God's work, you see. That title can cover all sorts of things. But God's work needs to be done God's way. And that's what Joshua was learning. And all this strategy had this one end. And that was that God alone might get the glory. You see, such obstacles as Jericho and such obstacles as we face in the world in which we live today can never be removed by human strategy or human planning. We need to get our strategy from God and learn to wait on God before we plan. I may have said this to you before, forgive me if I have. I remember at a time when I was going through a difficult spell in the ministry, in New Mills, and there were times when it was difficult. I had a number of contacts with people, telephone calls, letters, people saying to me, is it not time that you were in a more strategic place? Now, you didn't say that to the people of New Mills because New Mills to them was the hub of the universe. But you know what they meant. Was it not time you were in a more strategic place? place. And I thought, well, and then I began to ask, whose strategy are we talking about? God's or man's? Joshua had actually learned this lesson, you see, at an earlier incident when Israel had their first battle when they came out of Egypt at Rephidim when they met the Amalekites. And Moses was still alive and he was their leader and Joshua was just the young lieutenant. And there was a strategy they needed for this battle and Moses worked it out. And I guess that Joshua never forgot the lesson of that day. Moses said to him, he, the leader, the man who had all the responsibility, he said, I'm going away up into the mountain with Aaron and her. 
and you lead the battle. And the young untried Joshua went out to lead this battle and the man who seemed to be the most significant man left the field and went onto the mountaintop and the battle raged back and forward. You know the story. Now Israel prevailed, now Amalek prevailed and they couldn't understand what was happening until suddenly it dawned on them that the issue of the day lay not with the fighters on the field but with the intercessor on the mountain top, and when Moses lifted up his hands, Israel prevailed. And when Moses let down his hands, Amalek prevailed. There is a strategy that is folly to the world, and circumambulating Jericho with these horns of rams and blowing trumpets and shouting, it was folly to the world. But it was God's way to victory. And when any fellowship of God's people puts prayer in its proper primary place, that amounts to much the same thing in the church of God today as well as in the world. Divine leadership and divine strategy, and here finally... This chapter has something to say to us about the divine power that brought victory. What this strategy was saying all along, you see, was that power belonged to God and to God alone. The secret of Jericho's fall is in verse 2 of chapter 6. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given into your hand Jericho with its king and mighty men of valor. The essential issue, you see, was that God had wrought this victory for them before the battle began. I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and its mighty man. Now this is why the ark dominates the story. Do you notice that right through the whole of chapter 6 up to verse 13... The constant reference that you get is not that the people of God go round the city, but that the ark goes round the city. And the vital element in the whole story is the ark of God being taken round the city of Jericho. Now last Sunday morning we discovered that that stood for the presence of God in the midst of his people. And the point is that it is really God who is encompassing this city. This is the Lord of the whole earth, you see, weaving an invisible cordon around this city, the strongholds of which he will shortly push over. But it is God who is encompassing the enemy. Whether God did this by employing some instrument of nature like a minor earthquake is unimportant. The important point is the point that is made by the Apostle Paul, doubtless thinking of this passage, when he writes to the Corinthians, the weapons of your warfare are not carnal, they are not earthly or fleshly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now this is the key to all that happened on that day. And it's important for us to grasp this and apply it in New Testament terms. We are coming towards Easter. And what we are going to be exploring together in these coming days is the victory that God has wrought and won for us in Jesus Christ and has given to us. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Now, in spiritual terms, my dear friends, that is the point from which we engage in Christian warfare. We do not move towards victory. We move from victory, the victory that God has gained in Christ and gives to us. And that is exactly what God's people were doing at Jericho. They moved into the victory God had already gained and that victory for us is the victory over sin and death and hell and Satan and every possible expression of their opposition to us. 
But you will notice not only does the victory belong to God, but at the very end of the passage in verse 19, the spoils of victory belong to him too. And this really, in a sense, brings us back to where we began. All silver and gold, God says to them, and vessels of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. That is everything he gives them. Every blessing, every bounty is to be devoted to his honor and glory. It belongs to the Lord. And Israel's great tragedy was that somebody in the camp disobeyed that. And that's the story of chapter 7. But you see, the only safe place from which to serve God and to be the recipient of his grace and power is the place where we find Joshua here at the end of chapter 5 on his face worshipping and saying, what does my Lord bid his servant to do? That is the place from which we may live and serve God effectively. Let me apply this as we close to our daily life. You may be facing a Jericho and conscious of the threats and the fears that come in facing all kinds of fearful opposition, prospects that bewilder you. Well, now what Joshua says to us here is do not be surprised because this is of the essence of Christian experience and Christian living and Christian service. Our life is a life of spiritual warfare. He says, secondly, do not be afraid because the resources that belong to the one under whom we serve, if we have placed our lives there, are endless resources. There is nothing you will need in this world if you are ready to be bowed there before God and say, what will you have your servant to do? There is nothing that the grace of God will not lavishly supply you with. I guarantee you that on my soul this morning. But the final thing is do not be disobedient. Because it's so easy in the flush of victory, even if the victory is God's, to want the spoils for yourself. So the only safe place is at his feet. May God keep us victoriously there. Let us sing together as an expression of these truths, number 442.